Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to the Clarksville Cumberland Presbyterian Church. We are so glad to have each of you here in worship with us this morning. And if you're joining us online, we are happy to have you as well. If you'll take a look at the back of your bulletin for the schedule of events. Generally, I think our, our weekly schedule is just kind of norm for right now. So you can take a look through that. There's a few things that I want to make sure and draw your attention to. First, you'll notice each of you should have had a little tiny insert on the back of it, or on the front of it, depending on how it was in there. It said, save the date. This is our vacation Bible school, save the date, and a little mini version of the flyer that will go out um, on Facebook and different places throughout our church and our community. Everyone is invited. I want to make sure and draw your attention to where it says programs for ages 5 to 101. That's not a typo. It's an intergenerational vacation Bible school. This is something that we've done off and on throughout the years um, in our church, and it is a true blessing to the children and the adults um, of our congregation and our community. So I hope um, if you've not already spoken to me about a willingness to serve and you have that call on your heart, feel free to come to me at any time. I will find a place for you, I promise. Um, if, if not, please come anyways. Please come and, and enjoy it. Please enjoy time together with your congregation, with your church family. Make an impression, um, make an impact on a child's life or um, another church member's life. Because um, that's what we're there to do is, is grow near to God together. The theme at the top is the gate. So the narrow gate is what we're all working towards. So put this on your refrigerator, put it on your calendar, invite a friend, invite a neighbor. Like I said, everyone's welcome. I do also want to make sure and mention where it says age five. I know we have, um, we have children in this congregation that are under the age of five. They are absolutely welcome to participate in Vacation Bible School. We just ask that they rotate through with an adult. Um, there'll be group leaders, but we just feel like anybody under five, it would be best if they kind of have a one-on-one -on -one adult assigned with them. So just make sure and be aware children under the age of five are welcome to participate as well. Um, the only other thing I want to draw your attention to, unfortunately, they are home this weekend um, preparing for their wedding. Kristen uh, McQueen and Anthony Shingler, there's an announcement um, about a, a wedding shower that our Sunday school class is hosting for them on Sunday, April the 28th. Um, they have been attending in, in our congregation for the last couple years, have been a very wonderful part of our Sunday school program, and have helped in many aspects of the children's ministries in the last couple years. So we're thankful to have them in the congregation, and we look forward to um, helping to bless their marriage with a wedding shower. Um, it's just a come and go right after worship. So if you've not had the chance to meet them, um, and you need to put a face with a name, they are in our directory, so you can look them up. Um, and make that a point to meet them sometime soon because they really are a blessing to the congregation. Um, if, are there any other announcements? If not, prepare your heart um, and your mind for the light of Christ.
If you'll please uh, turn in your bulletin to the call to worship and read responsively. How joyful it is to celebrate the good news of God's love. We are called to be Easter people. Darkness cannot claim us. Fear cannot bind us. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so incredibly thankful for this day. The weather outside is beautiful. It's almost impossible not to feel joy when we look outside and see your creation. Thank you for this time together in your house. Lord, open all of our hearts, quiet our minds from anything that's worrying us. Let us be here with you, thankful for the time to worship you and to be together as a church family. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Please sing as uh, please stand as we sing our opening hymn this morning, number 130. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the lit and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. this call to confession. Gracious God, you give to us your greatest gift, your Son, Jesus Christ. As we still don't understand what is going on, you call us to be people of courage and hope, and yet we run and hide, doubting and fearing. You challenge us to proclaim our faith, but we huddle in darkness, whispering our words of discouragement. Shake us up, Lord. Now, if you will pray with me together the prayer of confession. 
Forgive us when we seem to need more prodding over and over again. Help us to see the presence of Jesus in our lives and remind us of all that he taught us to help us to live as disciples, serving you by serving others. Change us, remold us, make us truly the disciples you have called us to be. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. Do not be afraid. The light of God has vanquished the darkness. Christ is risen. Doubts are erased. Rejoice. God's love is poured upon you now and forever. Amen. It's now time for the children's message. So if all children will come forward, Miss Terry has your message up front. Good morning, boys and girls. You guys look so nice. It is so beautiful outside, isn't it? Miss Katie said it was a gorgeous day, and indeed it is. So weather's getting real nice. You know, today is the third Sunday of Easter. You know, and it's, it's kind of strange to say that because, you know, it's kind of like Christmas. Christmas, we celebrate the birth of Jesus, don't we? But after Christmas... There are so many wonderful stories and um, that Christmas stories, beautiful things that happened, and, um, and that's cool. And then you've got Easter, and unfortunately, that's the story of um, the death of Jesus, but so many great things happen after that story. And we know that, that Jesus um, died on the cross, and then he he was born again. He was raised to life. And that's that story of Easter. But there's other cool stuff that happens after that. So we're going to talk about a, a little story of after Jesus is alive again. You know, that must have been pretty scary. You think, you know, his friends being in this room, they were in a locked room, you know. And all of a sudden, Jesus appears to him and says, hey, guys. You know, can you imagine? I think my response would have been, ah! you know, that probably would have been my response. But, you know, that was something that was really new to them. They did not understand. They had to really kind of listen to Jesus. Now, Jesus calmed them down, and he says, you know, it is, it is me, it's Jesus. And I'm sure some of them were like, are you sure you're Jesus? Because how in the world can someone die and then come back to life? It's kind of a strange thing. And so he says, well, I'm telling you, I am Jesus. Look at my hands. And he showed them his hands. And you know where his, his wounds were from being on the cross? He's like, see, I'm showing you. And my feet. And they were like, oh, Maybe so. And he says, I am alive. I am Jesus and I am alive. And then they're like, oh, maybe. You know, I'm sure there were still some that were kind of doubtful. But then he says, you know what? I'm hungry. And people who are alive get hungry, don't they? So he's like, I'm kind of hungry. Can you feed me something? And they said, uh, well, sure, here's some fish. And gave him some fish and he ate. And they're kind of like, okay, so maybe this is Jesus, and he's alive. And Jesus started talking, and he says, you know, God's prophets used to tell everybody that, hey, a Messiah is coming, and that Messiah is going to be tortured and, and die a very horrible death, but then he will rise again. And, and all of his friends will tell everybody the good news, and they will have faith. And so his friends, Jesus' friends, were sitting there, and then they started to kind of clue in that, oh, my goodness, I do believe this is our Jesus. And they started to realize that they had an important job, and their job was to then go out 
and tell everybody the good news about Jesus. And you guys, even years later, you may not have been in that room to see Jesus come back to life. But I tell you, you guys have a big job too. And your job is to tell others about Jesus. And you know how you can do that? You can do that in so many ways. Like one is to be kind to everybody. Be kind. Sometimes people make us angry. They hurt our feelings. And that, that can be tough. But we have a job. We have a job to be kind and to show people the way that God wants us to be. So I want you to think about that as we've already celebrated Easter, the wonderful good news of Jesus being alive. And he died for our sins. And he died so that we can have eternal life. What a good gift. But now we have to think about our job. Our job is to spread his word and his love and just ask people, do you know Jesus? Let me tell you a story about Jesus. And you guys know lots of stories about Jesus, don't you? That you could share and you know how to be kind. Be kind to people. All right, let us bow our heads to pray. All right, are we ready? Dear God, thank you so much for sending your son Jesus for all of us. Thank you for his disciples who spread the good news and help us to spread the good news as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Very good. All right, boys and girls, you have a great week, okay?
This morning's offertory sentence says, Let us give thanks for the blessings that have come from God, and let us return our thanks through our tithes and our offerings. I'll remind you, if you have a prayer concern, please fill out a blue card and place it in the plate. Almighty God, we again thank you for your blessings. We thank you again for a beautiful day, and we thank you for these offerings that have been given this morning. And Lord, we pray that you bless each and every one of these gifts. Lord, bless the ministries of this church, and bless us, Lord, to go out and to be the hands and feet of Christ wherever we go, and to spread the good news and the love of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing hymn 297, Spirit of the Living God.
Good morning. Good to see everybody here this morning, and welcome to Clarksville Cumberland Presbyterian Church, and appreciate you tuning in and watching online. Um, got a few here that I want to give some updates on for our prayer list today. Uh, Russ Parchman has had a, uh, he had a toe removed on Friday, a surgical procedure, and so uh, he has some really bad infection in his bone, so they removed the toe and trying to clear up the infection, and hopefully he'll get to go home early in the week. So remember, Russ, in your prayers. Uh, Dudley Marklin is still at Tenova, but likely, um, Elsie said, either somewhere between Monday and Wednesday, he should be moved over to uh, Tennessee Veterans Nursing Home just for a couple of weeks for some rehab. He's been trying to uh, get well from pneumonia and had a blood clot in his leg and uh, just not moving around well, so they're going to try to get him up with some rehab and get him going. Uh, Lovey Cole is going to be having some tests run tomorrow, so remember her in prayer. Uh, Miss Lorene Hutchinson, uh, she has uh, began receiving radiation for her cancer down at uh, Vanderbilt. Uh, it's, to, it's to try to help shrink the tumors that she has in her, her, her shoulder and her back and got several that have appeared in her brain. And this, she said that what they said, this has come back from the breast cancer she had over 20 years ago. Um, so remember her in your prayers. The, the prayer quilt in the foyer is for her, and that'll be taken to her today. So if you get a chance to tie a knot on that, you're welcome to do so. Um, a couple of families from my last church ask that you remember the Condor family and the Gray family. Uh, both of them had losses here in the last week, and I was down there this weekend uh, for that. They uh, um, had the funeral for one family member yesterday morning and then for the other family member yesterday afternoon. And uh, so remember them in your prayers. Um, Teresa Schaff and Steve Schaff, remember Teresa, she had an MRI that uh, showed no cancer in her spine. They were afraid that it was going to be there, and it was not, so that's a praise. Uh, her husband Steve, though, has had a mild stroke, so remember Steve and Teresa Schaff. And then a couple uh, given here this morning for Danny Gibbs, uh, home with hospice. That's a neighbor of David and Sandy Watson. And then for uh, Robert Hutchison undergoing testing for lymphoma reoccurrence, uh, that's uh, Sheila Hunter's brother. So if we could add those, we'll add those to our prayer list this week. And uh, if you think of some others uh, during service that you'd like to have added to it, we'll be sure and do that. Um, let's go to God in prayer. Lord, on this morning, we take this opportunity, God, uh, to lift up to you those today that we have mentioned here before the body and to lift up to you those in the bulletin. I know... It means a lot uh, for the folks that are struggling right now and, and sick and in the hospital and whatever it may be, God, it, it, it gives them comfort to know they are being prayed for and they feel those prayers. So many times I've heard folks say, I can feel the prayers of when this church is praying for me. And Lord, help us to be faithful in doing so and to remember them this week. And God, hear us right now, Lord, as we come to you silently with any of these concerns that we have on our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for hearing us today. And, and God, we just uh, we, we pray for our church. We pray for our community. We pray for our country, God. We pray for all the turmoil going on around the world right now, Lord. There's, there's so much pain. There's so much suffering. And, God, we just uh, want to lift up to you all of these, these things to you, God. It's, there's a lot to take in. It, it's disturbing to even sit and try to watch the news anymore, God. There's so much going on. And, Lord, we just pray for you to, to put your healing hand upon us, God, and help us through these situations. Help us, God, uh, to try to, to love each other the way that we are supposed to, Lord, and help us to bring peace into this world, God, in such turbulent times. Lord, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that we can be here today and celebrate the risen Jesus Christ, God, your Son, who has changed everything, Lord, and gives us the hope that we need. So thank you for that, God. Hear us now, Lord, as we pray the prayer that your son Jesus taught his disciples to pray, and we still pray to this day. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Luke, um, chapter 24, verses 35 through 48. And I'm reading from the Pew Bible. It can be found on page 1048 if you'd like to follow along. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do do doubts rise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of boiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that, it is, that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scripture. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to be in your house. We're so thankful for your words. I pray that the peace that that is only possible to us through your son Jesus is on each heart here, so that we may hear your message through Brother Jimmy this morning. Be with him. Be with each of us. Let us leave here changed by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we get started, I do want to, to mention, I've heard several folks say today, where in the world is Ray Roby? Well, he is on vacation. He went with his children and grandchildren to Gatlinburg this weekend and it was like pushing a little bird out of the nest because he was, he was trying so hard to I don't know I don't think I need to go uh, I need to be here to unlock the doors I need to do this I don't want to miss church I was like Ray go be with your family so he is that's where he's at so don't worry he's not sick nothing's wrong with him he's, he's spending time with family which it's good um well all right well last week here we are we are Post-Easter, as as mentioned, we are in the third uh, Sunday of Easter, so we're post-Easter Sunday, and we're going through here leading up to Pentecost, and so we kind of left off with uh, the two disciples who had walked with Jesus, uh, had dinner with Jesus, and and didn't even recognize him uh, until the end of the meal there uh, when Jesus was breaking bread, and then they began to realize who it was, and then all of a sudden he just disappeared then and and was gone. Um, So what did they do? They ran back to Jerusalem the seven-mile trek, as we mentioned last week, to go back and to tell this good news to the rest of the disciples and all who were gathered together. So we're going to pick up there today with that. And as it's just been read, you've heard this, the events that take place here, um, beginning at verse 35, where the 11 disciples and, and the others, they're all, the 11 that are left, and then the other ones who are disciples who have gathered together, they're all there, uh, probably in the same room, the locked-up room that you hear about in John's Gospel, and so the two come to the room that were from Emmaus, and they go in there and begin telling them what had happened, begin telling them their experience of how they had a walk with Jesus and how they had um, been changed through that walk and how they realized it was him through the meal. And so all of these events, they're so excited. And they're telling, and speaking of walking with Jesus, last week I gave you all a handout uh, with some scripture to read each week. If you didn't get the email... Yeah, leave it to me. I had a typo in there for this week's scripture. I think I'd put Matthew 6. It's supposed to be Matthew 5. So if you go and you look at Matthew 6, you're going to be like, wait a minute. These verses are not there. So, you know, they're in 5. So just remember that. Just knock it back one, one chapter there. But they're gathered together, 
and they're discussing this, they're hearing this, and try to imagine yourself in that room with the disciples. Imagine you're one of those disciples and you're hearing all of these events take place. You've already had the women who had gone to the tomb on Easter morning, and they had gone and saw that it was empty. They had an encounter, and then Peter goes in. He sees the empty tomb, so they've all had those experiences, and now they're hearing these experiences that evening from these two other disciples, these two other followers, and what had happened with them. So do you think they're believing this? Do you think they're just like, wow, this is great, this is awesome? Uh, Do you think they're confused by this? I wonder if they were even jealous. I wonder if some of them, of the original 11, would they have been jealous that oh, he appeared to them? He, you know, we haven't got to see him yet. What's going on here? So you can imagine some of the thoughts and the discussion taking place here as uh, these two from Emmaus are explaining this. Well, they didn't have a whole lot of time to think about it, though, did they? Not a whole lot of time to discuss it because all of a sudden there's Jesus. He just shows up right there in the room they were in. Scripture doesn't say that he came in through the door. It doesn't say he climbed in through a window. It just says all of a sudden Jesus appeared. He's right there. And he says to them, peace be with you. And the way that they reacted, Jesus might as well have just said, boo, because they were scared and they were terrified and they were confused because they had no idea what's going on here. This is not supposed to happen. What's going on? And scripture says they were startled, they were frightened, and they thought they were seeing a ghost. There is no way this could really be Jesus. He was dead. He was crucified. He was buried. This cannot be him. And so I think it's safe to say that all of us, had we been there in that moment, I think we would have been startled as well. People just don't come back from the dead. They just don't appear out of nowhere unless they're a ghost or a spirit. And so they're trying to reason and rationalize and figure out what is going on here. Have y'all ever had any weird or scary moments in your lifetime that you just cannot explain? A moment that just kind of startled you. And when I, was, when I was in college, I had a friend of mine uh, from this uh, state in America that we like to call Arkansas. And he... Uh, <laughs> And he was, he was one of the, the, the countryest uh, folks I've ever met in my life. And, and he's, he's now a preacher. But he was like, hey, guys, y'all got to come back to Arkansas with me. You got to come back and see everything. You got to come where, where I live and all this stuff. And I was like, all right. So several of us, we got in you know, vehicles one weekend. And we went to Arkansas, in the middle of Arkansas, to where he lived. And on the way, we're like, well, what is there to do? You know, what? Is there anything fun to do around where you live? And he's like, oh, man, I got the best thing. What's that? The Dover Lights. We're like, the what? The Dover Lights. We thought, oh, is that like the the Northern Lights or something? No, no, it's Ghost Lights. What? Ghost Lights? Yes. I'm like, what do you mean? He said, well, years ago, there were pirates that buried their treasure in the woods of Arkansas. And then if you run up there on top of this ridge and you say, I've got your treasure, these ghost lights will come after you. Think about what I just said. Pirates... (laughs) In Arkansas. <laughs> that makes no sense. And us, we're like, what? Like, pirates are on the ocean. Arkansas is as far as you can get from the ocean. He's like, no, man, it's true. It's true. I've seen it. All right. So we go to see the Dover Lights. And on the way to Dover, to, to this little area, to see the Dover Lights, we had to drive through one of the towns I never thought I'd see in my whole life called Booger Holler is the name of it. <laughs> Booger Holler. And their claim to fame, I mean, they, instead of stopping to go to a convenience store to use the bathroom or stopping at even porta potties, they have a double decker outhouse. Double decker outhouse. You can Google it and see that. So we pass through there, and I'm like, we, this, this is the end. This is it. We are in the middle of nowhere. And we get up on this ridge, and we get parked, and we're looking out. And you can see a little valley, you see the trees, and he's like, this is it, man, this is it. This is where the pirates buried their gold down there. Okay, so what do we need to do? He says, you yell out, I've got your gold. And he said, then you'll see the lights coming up through there. And so nobody wanted to do it. Everybody's too scared to do it. So I'm like, all right, we got to get this going here. But I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm going to say it, but I'm not going to take responsibility for it. So I throw my friend under the bus and I said, Jason has got your gold. <laughs> He's looking at me like, what are you doing? I said, he said, all right. 
the crickets got quiet, the wind died down, and we look out, and sure enough, here are these lights coming on down in the valley, a light here, a light there. I'm like, what is going on here? And then over the next few minutes, they're getting closer, and they're getting closer, and I'm like, all right, guys, I'm gone. <laughs> we, we all get in the cars, and we take off and go. It was probably just local rednecks down there with flashlights running through the woods trying to chase us out, but it scared us to death. We took off and got going. There, there's times, crazy times, and moments like you could probably look back over your life and think, of, I don't know, this just doesn't make sense. For the disciples gathered in that room, all of them there, this didn't make sense. What was he doing? He was dead, and now here he is right here alive. You know, the two from Emmaus, they got a little bit better in tune with it because they spent personal time with Jesus, but the rest of them, they're up trying to figure out what is going on. This is unbelievable. So Jesus sees their faces, he sees their reactions, and the scripture says, he says, why are you troubled? Why do you have these doubts in your minds? Look at my hands, look at my feet, it's, my, it's me, touch me, see. He said, a ghost doesn't have flesh and bone. And still, they are startled, still they're trying to figure this out. You know, Jesus was literally standing there in the midst of them, he's flesh and blood. He showed them the wounds, and that's what he's talking about, you see my hands, you see my feet, this is where the nails had pierced me. Look at this. How could this be? He was just in a tomb. He was dead. So scripture says the disciples still stood there in disbelief, but filled with both joy and wonder. So, okay, it's starting to become a little bit more real. All right, he, flesh and blood, we can see the wounds. We know what happened. They're still struggling with believing this, but at the same time, so, you know, they're excited. They're wondering what's taking place here. They just didn't know how to respond. You know, the emotions of disbelief and joy and wonder as they're stirring through them. And I love how the Bible describes this and shows this to us. The honesty of the Bible showing what's taking place here. Their human weakness, their struggles. We can relate to that in our own lives. We can relate to that when we're going through moments where we're struggling with, um, with, with disbelief, we're struggling with fear, we're struggling with these things. But then Jesus takes it a step further. So he asks for something to eat, he asks for a piece of fish, and then he eats it right there in front of him to prove that he's flesh and blood, to, to prove that he's not a, a ghost or a spirit or anything like that. And now can you envision this? I think it's kind of, to me, it, it's kind of comical when you think about it. When he's standing there, he takes a piece of fish, and he's eating it, and you can just see them all just kind of leaning in and staring and looking at him, trying to figure out, is this, is, wow, this is really happening. He's really doing this right here in front of us. This, this is him. You would think, all right, now they got it all together, but they're still struggling. So here's where Jesus gets serious with them. And we read this in Scripture, and this is what he says. He says, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. All of these things were going to take place. We've had these discussions, guys. We've talked about this before. I've tried to tell you over and over and over, but you didn't get it. Now look at me. I'm here. Just like I said, I am here with you. And it says their minds were opened. And they begin to understand the scriptures. They begin to understand these things. And he goes on to say, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses to these things. These were instructions to them moving forward. He reminded them, look, I told you. I would be crucified, I would be dead, I'd be buried on the third day, I'd come back to life. You've just witnessed me alive. You've just seen me right here in front of you, showing you my hands, showing you my feet, eating a piece of fish. I've had, I had supper with these two over here. Yeah, it's, it's real. It's happening right now, and you all are witnessing it. You're seeing it. And then he backs it up with and goes on to say, and now you're going to be going out and preaching and spreading this good news and talking about what you have seen because you have witnessed. And now you're going to be going out and talking about repentance and the forgiveness of sins. And you're going to start right here in Jerusalem, which would be in the scariest place for them to start doing that, wouldn't it? That's the place where they'd be the, the, where the most 
uh, scrutiny is going to come from the religious leaders, from the Pharisees, from all these folks who are going to be coming after them. This will be the scariest place to begin doing this when you think about it. But he said, you're going to start here, and then it's going to go out into the rest of the world. You will be my witnesses to this resurrection. They could testify to what they had seen. Over the years, folks have tried to, to, to disprove this and say that Jesus really did not rise from the dead. They'll believe in him. Yes, he was a good man. He was born. He lived, had his disciples, did some great things. But when he was dead, he was dead. And that was the end of the story. Where did his body go? Don't know. Probably stolen. Maybe the disciples stole his body in order to try to trick everybody into thinking that he was resurrected. Maybe that's what took place. Or maybe they just hid it somewhere else. Maybe somebody else took it. You know, all of these theories and ideas from, from folks about that. But why? Why would they have done that? You think about what they ended up doing. Going out, placing themselves in harm's way. Going out and knowing that these religious leaders will be coming after them. Going out and knowing that they're going to be put down and made fun of and possibly even killed for going out and spreading this news of the risen, resurrected Jesus Christ. Why would they do that if it was all a lie and if it was fake? Why would they go, okay, for, for fame and fortune, for money, uh, for power, for all these things? How many of the disciples were rich? None of them. How many of them had protection because of this and, and were looked after and cared for by the, the high and mighty, the upper echelon of society? None of them. They were going out and putting their lives in harm's way every time they went out to spread this good news and to tell about what they had seen and to talk about forgiveness of sins. Did they get fame? Well, yeah, I guess you could say so in a way because they become famous for people knowing that they had been associated with Jesus, that they were his disciples, that they had been with him. And today they're pretty famous. You know, in our day and age, as we read through the scriptures, were they doing any of that for fame? No. The last thing they wanted was attention and fame. All they wanted to do was point people to Jesus. This is what we are called to do. This is our mission. This is what he left in our hands to do. Point people to Jesus and start these churches and let things take off. Going out and preaching this message would ultimately cost them all their lives. For some of the disciples, some pretty horrible deaths that they faced. Would they do that for a lie? No. I don't believe so. I don't believe so for one second. And then we read in, in Acts and we know that it wasn't just them that saw the resurrected Jesus, but it says even 500 or so witnesses were witnesses to the resurrected Jesus. They saw him. So today, let's think about this. For them, their experience with the resurrected Jesus changed them forever. And I think today, we too are witnesses to the resurrection. Have you physically seen Jesus' hands and feet? No. Have you physically watched him and seen him with your own eyes eat in front of you? No. But has your life been changed because of Jesus, because of his message, because he is alive, because of your encounter with him? Absolutely. If it wasn't so, you probably wouldn't be here right now if your life wasn't changed by the resurrected Jesus. We are we're witnesses. Witnesses to his resurrection. We can testify that Jesus has changed our lives and that we can go out now because Jesus has changed us. That should lead us to want to go out and help change the lives of others as well by spreading that good news, by talking about his resurrection, by reminding people to know that you can be forgiven for your sins. We can repent. We put ourselves sometimes in the crosshairs of those who deny the resurrection and think it's all foolishness. Why do we do it? Because we think it's an interesting story because we have an overactive imagination, because we think it's fun to go out and trick people. No, because we have a relationship with the risen Savior. We have a relationship with the Son of God, and through him we have a relationship 
with the God. We have encountered the resurrected Christ, and now we are witnesses to this resurrection. Let's pray. God, I thank you for that special moment that took place there. As Jesus appeared to his disciples, and yeah, it was confusing, it was scary, they didn't know what was going on in that moment, but Lord, if they had just slowed down and remembered what Jesus had told them ahead of time and took that to heart and believed, it wouldn't have been such a scary moment, startling probably, but it wouldn't have been as scary and frightening if they had actually taken that time and remembered to believe. And through his actions and through his words, they were able to clearly see that, yes, he was alive, that death did not keep him, and that truly was the resurrected Jesus right there in their midst. And God, we know that that moment changed their lives forever. Everything began to make sense from then, from there forward, God. And it wasn't too long that the Holy Spirit come upon them, and they were able to go out and start in Jerusalem and begin to spread the good news of the resurrected Christ. And God, today we are here in this building or watching online because we have encountered the resurrected Christ. We are witnesses to the resurrection. And thank you, God, that we can be witnesses. And Lord, let us go out and share our testimony, share our witness with others, God, and continue to grow that kingdom that began on that day, that began to grow on that day, Lord. We thank you, God, for that amazing miracle, and we thank you for the miracle that keeps going each and every day in our lives of the resurrected Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we sing our closing hymn this morning, hymn 498, I Love to Tell the Story.
I hope that you love to tell that story. You think about it, somebody told you that story. Maybe a long time ago, maybe it wasn't that long ago, but you heard that story and it changed your life forever. So feel free to continue to share that story. It's the most beautiful story you're ever going to hear. It's the most beautiful story you're ever going to share. Continue to do so. Let that story always flow from you to someone else, and we'll continue to see this kingdom of God just get bigger and bigger and bigger. It's quite amazing when you think about it. Should we ever be surprised when God shows up and does something in our lives, something that startles us? You know, we really shouldn't. Because God is always doing amazing things. Be looking for it. Be ready for it. Because God loves to surprise us. And again, we shouldn't even be surprised because it's God. That's pretty awesome. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you for coming together and worshiping. And uh, Acolytes and myself, we're going to walk on out. And as we do so, our choir is going to lead us uh, in our benediction. and keep you forever, grant you peace, perfect peace, courage in every endeavor, lift your eyes and see his face, and his grace forever. and keep you forever.